up your Bibles to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24. I, I planned on doing this all in one shot, but because of all of everything that's been going on right now, beloved, and because we have fellowship today, I may have to make this a two-parter. I'll play it by ear. I'll see how the Lord leads. Uh, maybe I can jump around here, hither or thither. <laughs> Let me just set the timer here so we can have it for TV. Matthew 24, my message this morning is God's household servants. God's household servants. We just read something about that in our responsive reading in the Gospel of St. Luke. But I want to pick up the theme and I want to preach on it this morning. Matthew chapter 24. Let's all stand up please for the reading of God's Word. We're going to begin with verse 44 and then read right down to verse 51. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. He says in verse 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not at him. And by that, he's not only speaking about the second advent, he means that we're always one heartbeat and one breath away from meeting God. Amen? Amen. You know, nobody thinks that they're going to die today, but you never know what God's will is. He says, when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he's not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Holy Father, as we consider this subject this morning, we pray, Father, that you, through the power of your Spirit, would open up the eyes of our understanding and help us, Father, as we grasp these things, to uh, just plow up the fertile soil of our heart and let the seed of the Word of God drop in, that it may grow, and we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask in His name, Amen, and you may be seated. If you were to read the Gospel of Matthew, uh, beloved, we see in verses 24 and 25 uh, that our Lord is speaking here prophetically, or eschatologically would be the theological term. So He's speaking prophetically to His disciples, and He commingles the prophecies and the future of the last days that are going to precede both the disciples of Jerusalem and also the end of the age when he returns at the second advent. The Bible states that Christ's second coming is synonymous, synonymously also called. Tom, would you close that window right there, please? Keep, will you, Tom? Okay. It's synonymously called two things, beloved. You'll read in the Bible sometimes the second advent is called the day of the Lord, and sometimes it's called the day of judgment. Because when Christ comes, there is a lot of events that will comment it concomitantly be happening uh, together. But in Matthew 24, Jesus gives us some prophetic and precursory signs to look for that are going to precede and herald the general time, but not the exact time of the Lord's coming. I want you to look at verse 36, and then we're going to drop down to verse uh, 42. Look at verse 36. Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now drop down to verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not the hour your Lord doth come. Now here Jesus explicitly states that the second coming, and he's coming again, beloved, listen, to consummate his redemptive plan for man that started at his first advent. In other words, Jesus isn't finished yet. When he said, Teletestii on the cross, it is finished, that meant that the redemption had been paid. But now he has to work out that plan of redemption. And that's what he's doing through this church age. But he's coming sometime in the future, at the end of this age, beloved, and he shows us here that this is an infallible, an inviolable, and an indisputable fact. So if you're here today saying, well, Jesus isn't going to come or whatever, then all you're doing is lying to yourself because Jesus cannot lie. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, um, it's going to happen. The second advent is going to happen as surely as the first advent happened. 
350 prophecies of the coming of the Messiah and they were fulfilled down to the letter. Many of them when he was on the cross when he couldn't come down and fulfill them. But God knows the end from the beginning. But hear me now and I don't want you to miss this. Just like at the first advent, many people were not prepared for the coming of the Lord, it will be likewise the same thing at the second advent. Amen? The question is this, are you prepared for the coming of the Lord? I hope you can say, Amen, preacher. I'm ready. I was born ready. But I want you to notice what else Jesus explicitly taught here in these texts, beloved. He said that no man knows the exact time of his coming. He says no angel, no being knows the exact time of his coming. And we want to say, beloved, that even he in the day of his humiliation, when he emptied himself of his attributes, divine attributes, the glorious attributes of it, he said, he didn't even know the time of his coming. I'm sure he does now upon his resurrection and his glorification. He knows the time of his coming. But even in the days of his flesh, Jesus did not know the time of his coming. But notice what he does say. The only one who knows the exact time of, the coming of Jesus Christ is God the Father only. Would you say amen out there? In Deuteronomy chapter 29, in verse 29, the Bible says this that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Now, beloved, the times and the seasons of all things are known only to God the Father. Amen. I don't know the time and season of my life. I happen, uh, you know, it's been very reflective this week. And you look back and you say, Lord, I honestly didn't think I was going to make 20 years of age, but the Lord brought me there, and now that I'm 31, I'm just surprised at all. But you get reflective, especially as you get a little bit older, because you have more of your life behind you than you do in front of you. Amen? So God knows the times and the seasons we don't. So what is Jesus saying to us? He's saying that we can know the general time of His coming, but nobody knows the exact or the precise time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, preacher, why are you saying that to me? Folks, see me on TV? I want to tell you why. Because, beloved, I don't want you to listen to any date setters. I don't want you to listen to any seers or soothsayers or these people who say that they're psychics or those who claim to be diviners or these so-called uh, self-acclaimed prophets today who say they know the exact time when the Lord Jesus Christ will come. Beloved, if church history has taught, taught us anything, it is proven that all who have ever set dates have done and still do, beloved, they have been not only wrong, but consistently wrong. Amen? Part of my studies, when I, when I was studying the Anti-Nicene Fathers, that's the fathers in the first, first to the fifth century, you know, almost every father predicted the coming of the Lord. He's coming this, you know, 50 years, he'll be here. By the middle of the second century, he'll be here. Now we're in the 21st century. <laughs> right. I want to tell you something, beloved. They never saw what we saw or have seen. And so uh, we don't know the exact time or the hour, but you get my drift as we go along here. Because Jesus said, remember, only God the Father knows the exact time. But having said that, in Matthew 24, Jesus did give us some clear, now listen to me, precursory signs to watch for that indicate that the general time of his coming will be soon. Indeed, that it will be even at the very doors. There's things that we can see that he prophesied about that are unfolding around us in greater frequency. He says these are the things, these are the precursory signs that are going to announce the coming of the Lord. For example, if you were to read the whole of Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus predicted there'd be a great influx of false prophets and false messiahs who would arise and they would deceive multitudes of people both in and out of the kingdom, in and out of the church, beloved, in the last days just before he returns. Do we see that today? Like never before. I know, beloved, I've been a Christian a lot of years, I've taught you. I've never seen it like I have today. Jesus predicted there'd be an increase in wars. And he said, in verse 20, chapter 24, read it today. And pestilences, virus, bacteria, things of that nature, beloved, that we see on TV. Famines in the last days just before he comes back. And he said kingdom would rise against kingdom. And nation would rise against nations in the last days just before he comes back. Do we see that happening? You know, beloved, in the last 200 years, there's not been 10 years of peace in the world. 
There's been a wall somewhere. In the, imagine that. World War I was supposed to be the wall that ended all wars. That ended in 1917. By 1939, we were into World War II. And, so, uh, and we've had many wars since that time. Jesus predicted that lawlessness and iniquity would abound in the world in the last days, just before he comes back. Just turn your TV on, watch the news at night. Jesus predicted that the love of many would wax cold. The love for him, the love for his people and his church, the love for his word, the love for other people in the world, beloved, would wax cold in the last days just before he came back. In this very chapter, Jesus predicted there would be cosmic and cataclysmic signs in both heaven and earth in the last days just before he comes back. We see hurricanes, we see tsunamis, we see floods, we see earthquakes, beloved. I remember reading the Seismographic Institute of Japan in, in, in um, uh, the turn of the 20th century, they recorded 50 tremors a year in Japan. Not just for the world, they monitor the whole world. Do you know that right now, listen to me, there's 500 tremors a day? And the biggest fault is Tom. The, big, no, the biggest fault is not the San Andreas fault that's out there in California. It runs from Maine all the way on the east coast of Florida. Do you know that? So uh, do we see these things happening? Yes, we do, beloved. And so God says we're to look up. Look up, he says, for your redemption, what? Draw it nigh. Jesus predicted there'd be a great apostasy and lukewarmness in the church in the last days just before he comes. Even Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, he said, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come an apostasia, a falling away first, an apostasy from the faith, and the man of sin, that final antichrist, be revealed. But beloved, positively speaking, Jesus said this also. Jesus predicted that the gospel of the kingdom would go forth in the Great Commission and be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations in the last days just before he comes. But he said, and then would the end come. Boy, that sounds just like today, isn't it? You think about it. The gospel goes forth from TV, satellite, radio, almost every nation in the world. Uh, my wife's uh, uh, cousin, he was an engineer in, during the Vietnam War. He was in the Army. And he stopped over our house uh, I don't know, last summer or the summer before. I don't remember what I had for breakfast. But, but he says to me, he says, you ever want to go back to Vietnam? I said, me? There's no way the boogeyman lives. I ever want to go back. I, I don't want to see anything to do with Vietnam. He said, but you've got to see this, Joel, he said. You go through all the villages, all straw huts like before. There's pigs, chickens everywhere, and there's a satellite dish on top of the hut. You go inside there. These people are wearing raggedy clothes. They got a cell phone. They got a computer. Right? <laughs> I mean, come on, right? But uh, beloved, see, the, Jesus said the gospel would go forth as a witness. A witness to what? A witness that Jesus is the eternal Son of the living God. A witness that He wants to save everyone. A witness that there's good news amongst the bad news. God says, "Come unto Me. Come unto Me, all ye that have labor and heavy laden." And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest to your souls. Jesus wants no one to be lost. Amen. He wants them all to be saved. So, beloved, I think we're on the, best, the very cusp of the second advent. But you know, there's another great sign. In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, Daniel said, At the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be greatly increased. He's saying that in the end time, beloved, there's going to be a great increase, number one, in travel. Many are going to run to and fro. We can go to outer space around the world today in hours. Then he said there'd be a great increase in knowledge, not only in theological knowledge, but in technological knowledge. Now, I look that up. We used to double our knowledge every 100 years. In the last 50 years... The last 15, and by the way, that's our generation, but you folks who make fun of us Vietnam vets, right? This is our generation. Technology has increased 500%. So you can see, beloved, that all, you know, every day something's new. I mean, now you get a smartphone, you can ask it a question, and like a dummy, can you tell me what my wife really likes? <laughs> so I can buy her a present. Sure, Joel, you should know this by now. I don't have a smartphone. I don't want a phone that's smarter than me, I'll tell you right now. You folks do, that's up to you. But, beloved, so Daniel tells us these things, right? Now, Jesus did not tell his disciples all this to scare them. 
That was not the purpose why he gave us this. He gave us this to inform them. Why? I want you to look at verse 13 and 44. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. He says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now I want you to drop down to verse 44. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now, Christ wanted, notice, both to warn and encourage his disciples. Why, Pastor Joel? Because he wanted them to be ready and prepared for the real spiritual battle that's going to exist in the last days, beloved, and then his sudden and his unexpected coming. Why? So they not get so frightened and discouraged that they depart from the faith or they'd be caught off God, and then, uh, beloved, when he came back, and ultimately they lose their souls. He's saying, look it, I'm telling you this ahead of time, so when you see it in the past, you know that I've already predicted this. This is part and parcel of the divine plan that I've written. This is exactly what's going to happen. Look at these precursory signs that will announce and warn you of my second advent. <coughs> Excuse me. So he's trying to prepare them ahead of time. Now, beloved, in verse 13, when Jesus says, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. When he uses the word endure, a hope of no, Meaning uh, uh, that if his disciples want to ultimately be saved when he comes back, then they, they need to make sure that they hupomeno, that is that they persevere in the faith. Hupomeno, that you endure, that you continue in the faith. How long should I do it, preacher? He's saying until the end of the age, beloved, when he returns. Would you say amen? So as he just stated here, beloved, right throughout this chapter, He's saying they mustn't be deceived. They mustn't betray him. They mustn't let their love for him grow cold. They mustn't backslide and apostatize from the faith. And they mustn't ever quit or give up under persecution or pressure, but instead personally be prepared for the coming by persevering in the faith and enduring unto the end. And by the way, that's why he said in verse 44, beloved, he exhorts us to be ready. That Greek word, hetoimos, means to be daily alert, daily watching, fully prepared. Listen, another, hetoimos, it means also to mean primed. It means to be anticipating his sudden and unexpected coming at any moment, especially when we least expect it. Now, I've taught you this before, and I've told you, I always say every morning, Lord, is it today? I get up, I'm an early riser. Is it today, Lord? When I go to bed at night, I always quote it. Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day, other is night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech or language, as his voice is not heard. The whole heavens declare the glory of God. But I always say, Lord, is it tonight? Oh, God, let this preacher be ready. Is it tonight, God? With your spirit, oh, God, is it tonight? You know, when you least inspect it, it's going to happen. Have any of you ever really gotten a shock? I hate working with electricity. I've been knocked across the room, and it's been a shocking experience, you know. <laughs> uh, I hate it. And you never expect it. And you know, you can't get your hand away close enough, and fast enough. You know, you're going, ah! Oh, boy, I hate it, right? <laughs> I was telling Brother Kenny, I says, here, you work on it. I'm not, I've had it. I walk around my hair like this, right? Uh, I, I just hate it. But, beloved, he's telling us that he's coming at a time when we're not going to expect it. He's not going to send you a text. He's not going to send you an email. He's not going to call you on the phone and say, oh, by the way, I want you to get ready right now. I'm coming back. Okay, you've got plenty of time. Don't worry about it. That's not what he said. He said, I want you to look at these precursory signs that are unfolding all around you. And I just read some of them. Not all of them to you. I just told you about some of them. He says, when you see these things come to pass, he says, look up. For your redemption draweth nigh. Oh, beloved, listen to me now. God says, I want you to be morally and spiritually alert, are you? I want you to be morally and spiritually vigilant and watchful and ready and prepared. I want you to be persevering in the right to the end. Why? Because the Bible teaches this. Now listen to me. When Jesus came at the first advent, the Bible says he came as a, a lamb, right? He was the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Bible teaches when he comes at the second advent, he's coming back not as a lamb, he's coming back as a roaring lion from the tribe of Judah. 
He's not coming back to save anyone at the second advent. He's coming back now to rescue those who are saved and judge the world. This whole probationary age of grace, he's been trying to call people out of the world unto himself. That's the purpose of us existing, and that's the purpose of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen out there? So we're to be ready. We're to watch. We're to wait. Why? Because one day, now you hear it from your preacher. You've heard me preach this a long time. But one day when you least expect it, the, suddenly it's gonna, the sky is suddenly going to crack open. And when it does, the Lord Jesus Christ, not as just a man, the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his undiminished glory is going to appear. Whoever set that sun on fire must be more glorious than that sun. Or he won't be God. So the Bible teaches that Jesus is indeed coming back again. Amen? The Bible nowhere teaches the heresy that's going around today, that there is a silent secret in a visible pre-tribulation rapture, as many sadly believe. At the second advent, Jesus, the Bible says, will appear personally. He will appear visibly. He will appear publicly. He will appear universally to the whole world. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, John said that Jesus said, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen, John says, come, Lord Jesus, amen. Every eye will see him. There's no silent and secret pre-tribulation rapper, that escapist mentality that's going around today. Christians have been persecuted. I've been teaching in Sabbath school all through the church age and they are today. So scripture exhorts God's people to be constantly and continuously looking for Christ's return because Christ's return in the Bible is called the blessed hope of the church. Now, beloved, listen to me. The blessed hope. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, the Bible says this. This is Paul speaking. He says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking. Is it today, Lord? Looking. See, you never stop what? You're always, is it today, Lord? You're ready. You're primed. You're anticipating. You're watching. You're waiting. That's the blessed hope of the church. That's when you're going to see Jesus. That's when you're going to fall at his feet. That's when I'm going to look at the nail-scarred hands, beloved, and his feet. I'm going to put my hand in the side. I can't wait to talk to Noah. I can't wait to talk to Abraham. And I'll tell you what I'm going to say to Noah. How come you didn't swat those two mosquitoes when you get on the ark? <laughs> I remember one day, you know, my wife never gets mosquitoes. She's like, and me, I'm already roasted in the oven already, especially in the summer. I take my shirt off and get all dark, right? But mosquitoes love me. Wood ticks hate me. She gets the wood ticks. I get the mosquitoes. But uh, I said to Ellie, I said, Ellie, when I get a hold of Noah, I'm going to thrash him. She says, why, Joel? I said, he didn't swat those two mosquitoes. <laughs> I'd have given him some Roundup. <laughs> but Ken, I can't wait to talk to Moses. I can't wait to talk to Paul. I can't wait to talk to these great heroes of the faith. Let me tell you what me thinks. Me thinks that we get to heaven because the Bible says we're going to be learning for all eternity. You know what God may do? He says, hey. Bring us all into this big, huge room with this huge surround sound screen. Today we're going to see how I created the worlds. And we're going to sit there, and the Bible says that the angels, the sons of God, shouted for joy. And he's going to say, earth, appear. Hey! We're going to be, Woo! everything out of nothing, ex nihilio, right? And then he's going to show us what happened with Adam and Eve. And we'll, boo, boo. <laughs> He's going to show us who made ties. <laughs> I hate ties, don't you? But, beloved, that's why it's the blessed hope of the church. It'll be a great reunion with our lost. I'll see my mom again. I'll see my dad again. I'll see my friends again. So many that lost, so many people that I buried uh, within the church. I'll be able to see them again. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying look up, pack up. Why, Pastor Joel? Because you're going up. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, our Lord has said all these things in Matthew 24 because upon his ascension back to heaven, he'd be gone for a while until the Bible says the times of restitution of all things, which we know is at the second advent. This is when he comes back and completes his plan. And in the meantime, during his absence, his servants 
would now be in charge of his household, he says, here on earth. And his desire for them is that they would be living holy, righteous, and godly lives and also be faithfully discharging their duties as they persevere in the faith until he returned. And so therefore, beloved, here in verses 44 through 51, Jesus gives his servants a sober warning. He tells us everything about the kind of servants we're going to see between the time of his ascension to heaven and also the second advent. So we know that the, what this era is, this time span, amen? He shows us. Now, he contrasts and he compares two types of God's household servants that are going to be found when he returns. Now, I'm hoping I can give you both today. I'm, plan I'm planted by the clock. Uh, I told you we got a funeral going on, people that want to go to the, a whole bunch of things going on. So I'll see how the Lord leads me, okay? I ought to have you out here by seven tonight. Don't worry about it. Now, the first thing I want you to see is the righteous household servant. What did I say? Say it again. The righteous household servant. I want you to look at verses 45 through 47. He says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give him meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Now, beloved, to be righteous, what does that mean? It means this. It means to have Christ's imputed righteousness on you, to declare you righteous before the throne of God. And it means to have his imparted righteousness in you to sanctify you and de uh, develop you or make you righteous. The purpose of salvation is not so you can have a ticket out of hell. The purpose, purpose of salvation is to conform and transform us into the image of Christ. Amen? So there's much more to it than just, well, you're not going to hell, now you're going to heaven. Now, what does it mean also to be righteous? It means this, beloved. It means that through the supernatural power of God's Spirit and grace, and Christ's imputed and imparted righteousness, God expects us now to become individually righteous or personally righteous. That is, Christ's righteousness must now become our righteousness. That is, the righteous and supernatural principles and precepts and power of His Spirit-empowered word, will, and ways must so infiltrate and control our mind, must so infiltrate and control our hearts and our soul and our spirit and our life that it radically starts changing us. Amen? That we're not the same person we used to be. In other words, Christ saves you as you are, but Christ never does what? He never leaves you as you are. Would you say amen out there? So God changes us into a much different person. A righteous person is someone who comes to the Lord as a rebel, he's a rascal, he's a sinner, and God starts turning him into a hagios, a holy one, a saint of God. That's what it means. The Bible doesn't teach that Mary's a saint or, or uh, you, know, you have to have re-sainthood or whatever. The Bible teaches anyone who's born again is a saint. He's a separated one, and he's being made holy in God's sight. So there's no special, quote, unquote, saints according to the Word of God. That's purely uh, tradition. It has nothing to do with what the Word of God has to say. But anyways, beloved, as you're being made righteous, now you're living by a much higher and godly a moral and spiritual code of ethics and standard because God's spirit and grace has supernaturally and completely changed your whole moral and spiritual value system. Amen? I know the day that I got saved, and I didn't know, it, I mean, believe me, I, I was a dummy. I'm not saying that to be self-deprecating. There was no born-again churches then. I, I made a pact with God in Vietnam, and I, I said I'd read his Bible, and I did read his Bible, and God, through his grace, saved me. But the first thing I noticed was I couldn't swear anymore. I, I, I could not, and through the grace of God, I haven't swore for 20 minutes. I mean, I haven't sworn for a long time. <laughs> Though I've got to tell you, there's times when I say, boy, Lord, I could really express that. I feel so good right now if you just let me rip. <laughs> you know? And you never did, David. Huh? Come on now. <laughs> you know I've been working with you on that. Ooh, excuse me. Confessing David says. But anyways, beloved, it's transformed our conscience. 
It transforms our conduct, our character, our conversation. And that's why Paul said it, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, beloved. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's what? He's a new creature. He's a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. In other words, beloved, a righteous person finds themselves progressively and increasingly being conformed and transformed into the image of Christ. Now, hear me. Don't lose me now. When you're born again, this is exactly what salvation and sanctification is all about for those who name the name of Christ. There's no such thing as getting saved as a ten-rung ladder, and you say, I just want to stay on the first rung. God will knock you around a little bit if you don't get to the second one. And what you don't want to do is get to the third one and have to repeat the second one again. Because God will chasten you. Why? Because he loves you. And I told you, that word chastening in the Bible is the Greek word peidia. It means the child train. God will take you out to the woodshed if you don't take the next step. See, God says, I'm going to make you grow. You are going to mature in the faith. You're going to become more moral. You're going to become more spiritual. You're going to have some character. You're going to have the right conduct. I'm going to clean up your mouth. I'm going to do all those things to you. See, you are going to be a righteous person, a righteous servant of God. Would you say amen out there? In other words, beloved, God says when you're genuinely converted, you're going to be supernaturally changed into a son of God and a saint and a servant of God and a soldier of God and a steward of God and a seeker of God and a sheep of God. You want me to go on? I'll try to keep it in essence for you. I can make them up as I go along. But he says, but now Christ, your Lord and Savior, becomes your divine shepherd. He becomes your divine king and in and over your life, beloved, as you subject yourself now to him and you begin to submit and surrender to him. Now, both scripture and context here reveals that Christ said this to his disciples because this is the kind of servants he expects all his followers to be like in his absence. Look at verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his house to give him meat in due season. Now, there's three particular words here that I want to point out to you. I want you to hear the Greek rendition of them because I think they'll give you some nuances and shades of light that you probably haven't seen before. Because he spoke this to his disciples. The first word I want you to see in this text is the word doulos. It's the word servant. He says, who's a faithful doulos, a faithful servant? Now that word doulos doesn't just mean someone who serves. It means a bond slave. What does it mean? Bond slave. Now what is a bond slave? Bond slave is someone who has willingly turned over his will in life to the will and life of another. See, this is what happens when you turn over your life to Christ. You turn over your will to Christ. You're a doulos. You're a what? You're a bond slave now in God's sight, beloved. And he becomes the king of your life. Or are you still sitting on the throne of your life as the king over your life? Who's sitting on the throne of your heart? Is it the Lord or is it you? Are you doing what you want to do? Or are you doing what he wants you to do? This, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what I wanted to do this week. I wanted to run. I wanted to get away from it all. I'm sick and tired. Of all. It's all the stuff I wanted to do. But it can't seem like it's that's not coming up and coming in whatever. But God said, this is what I want you to do, Joel. And you know what? Through grace, you do it one at a time. Amen? One thing at a time, and I've been in long enough to know that God sustains you. He supports you. He strengthens you. I didn't know if I was going to have a message for you today. I said, Lord, if I have to get up and holler and preach a little, holler and preach a little. He said, what else is new, Joel? You do it all the time anyways. That's what I was going to do. But, but beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here. Is he saying... I want you to turn over the reins of your will and your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn it over to me. If you do that, then you're a doulos. You're a bond slave. And if you're a bond slave, then in my sight, you're a righteous servant. Would you say amen? You know, we all love the Apostle Paul. We all love to read the Pauline epistles, so to speak. But he said this when he got saved, beloved. When he introduced himself in his letter to the churches at Rome, he just humbly said this in Romans 1.1. He didn't say Paul, the great apostle. He didn't say Paul who had this radical encounter with the glorified Christ on the road to Damascus. When you read the epistle to the Romans, in Romans 1.1, he says, Paul, a servant, a doulos, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of Christ. Paul 
a doulos. Lord, I'm yours. I'm your bond slave is what he's saying. You see, beloved, he knew who his Lord and Master was. The question is, do you and I know it? You know what Paul's saying when he says, I'm a bond slave? He's saying, now I'm nothing but a slave of Christ. Now I'm nothing but a servant of Christ. Now I'm nothing but a bondman of Christ. And I've now lost my own will. I've now lost my own uh, identity. I've now lost my own desires. i now lost my own life in His. Now, beloved, he says in Philippians 1.21, he says, for, for to me to live is to die is gain. You see, it's no longer I that's living. In fact, he went on, beloved, referring to his baptism and conversion in Galatians 2.20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer I that's living. When I die, Paul died, Saul died, that rabbi died. Now I belong to Christ. Now I'm his servant. Now I'm his born slave. He owns me. When he says go, I go. When he says do this, I'll do that. I'm a righteous person now. I'm a born slave in the sight of the living God. Would you say amen? So that's the first word I wanted you to see was the word do loss. Number two. The second word I want you to see is the word therapia, which is the word household. What is the household? Meaning Christ's family, his domicile, his home. Now listen to me. He's talking about the place where he lives, now lives on earth by his spirit during his long absence where all of his divine possessions are stored. And it is not in a material, physical building. God has given us a wonderful sanctuary. We're so blessed, more than a lot of churches, but we've been blessed. But this isn't the church. This is where the church meets. This is the sanctuary, amen? But you listen to me now. God's household is now the temple of your body. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body is the household and the temple of God on this earth. Would you say amen out there? Also, beloved, God's household is now the church corporately. Now, I'm just going to paraphrase this for time's sake. If you were to read Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, Paul says that the church is the household of God. Paul says that the church is the holy temple of the Lord. Paul says that the church is the habitation of God through the Spirit. And Paul also says that the church is the, spirit, the spiritual kingdom of God on this earth, where all of his divine possessions are. Now, boy, you have to say to yourself, does Jesus have a lot of jewels? Well, the Bible says he's coming for us. Where is jewels, right? But no, that's not what it's talking about. Does Jesus have all kinds of money? Is that what he's talking about? What kind of divine possessions, preacher, is Jesus talking about here in these scriptures? Well, you ask some of the most intelligent questions there are. You know that? I'm amazed at you people. You say, beloved, this is where the divine possessions of his Holy Spirit in truth are now found. You want to find the Holy Ghost? Come on to church. You want to find the truth of the word, will, ways of God? What do you do? You come to church. Listen to the preacher. Read the word of God. You see, beloved, this is where the divine possessions of his mercy and grace are now to be found. This is where the divine possessions of his salvation and his sanctification are now to be found. This is where the divine possession, beloved, of the gospel and the great commission and the ministration of God's word will in ways. That's where they are found, beloved. This is the very household that Christ speaks of. And he says that in his lengthy abscess, I'm leaving servants in charge of all of my mercy, all of my grace, all of my truth, all of that, I'm leaving you in charge. You preach my word. You teach my word. You live my word. You obey my word. You are my household servant, and I want you, because you're going to give an account someday, to take care of my divine possessions. Now that's a weighty charge to me. How about you? Huh? Well, that's the second word, but there's a third word I want you to see here. And I guess I'm only going to get to point number one today. <laughs> you mean we aren't there yet? We're halfway there. <laughs> there's a third word that I want you to see here, beloved. 
And that word is the word kairos. He says, due season. Now, what does he mean by that? He means that the Lord will reward all his servants at just the right time, the fixed time, the specific time he returns in regards to how they managed his household and divine possessions that he left them in charge of when he left. At the right time, Just when only God the Father knows, he's coming back. And he says, now I'm going to see how you did. What are you saying to me? I'm saying, beloved, that's why no matter how tough things get as a Christian, that's why no matter how bad things may get as a Christian, no matter how frustrating or trying things may get as a Christian, we must never quit. We must never give up. We must never forsake Christ. Amen? Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 9. He said, be not weary in well-doing. Now listen to me. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Use the same word, kairos. In due season we're going to what? Reap. You know, when we first formed this church, I did the snow shoveling. I cleaned the bathrooms. I vacuumed the rugs. I did it. And I did it there for five years. And then one day, Brother Dave said to me, he says, Pastor, you shouldn't be doing this. I handed him the broom. I said, Dave, no, Dave. He says, well, we're going to get the board. (laughs) Dave smarted at me, see. We'll get the rest of the guys to kind of chip in. (laughs) But you see, you did it all. I was the bookkeeper. I was the preacher. uh, You see, beloved, things have to be done. People come to church. They put their feet up. They say, my, the house is clean. Boy, this is nice air condition. Thank you, Lord, for the heat. You have any idea what goes on behind the scenes to run a place like that? A couple million bucks here. Okay, any idea what it takes to run this? There's a lot to it. There's more to it than you think. Amen? So it's a weighty responsibility. So now, beloved, what I'm saying, now that we have a basic understanding as to the context, now I want you to understand these three traits about a righteous household servant, and I'm going to blow right through them. i got ten minutes. Number one, he's responsible. Look at verse 45. Who then? the faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give him meat in due season. Jesus says a righteous servant is pistos. That is, he's faithful, meaning he is trustworthy. He's reliable. He's dependable. He takes great care of the divine possessions his Lord has entrusted him with. It means he can be counted on to perform and fulfill all the duties and obligations as a household servant. It means he tries to live a holy, righteous, and godly life in obedience to God's commandments. Why? Because he loves his Lord and he wants to please his Lord. Beloved, when you love someone, you want to please them, right? I I love doing things for my wife, my children, my grandma. They please them. I want to please them. And I love my Lord and I want to Please them. And though some of the things he asked you to do, you say, look, you sure? (laughs) Oh, please you? Yeah, you sure? (laughs) Not pleasing me, Lord. (laughs) And beloved, not only that, but it also means he's not only faithful, a reliable, dependable person, but notice the Bible uses the word phroninos. It means that he's wise. That is, he's thoughtful, prudent, he's intelligent. Why is he intelligent? Why is he so wise? Because he believes the Lord's promise that he will return again, and then when he does, he's going to have to give an account for his actions as a household servant. So in anticipation of the second advent, what is he doing? He's watching for his Lord's return. He's waiting for his Lord's return. He's working. He's going about the business. He wants to be found doing God's work when he comes. And I don't mean you have to do what I'm doing. Remember, your job is your ministry. You become the witness there for anybody. uh, They want to see Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? No matter what God's called you to do, whether you've been called to be a floor sweeper, whether you've been called a janitor, a scientist, a doctor, a lawyer, a policeman, a fireman, whatever it may be, that is your ministry for now. That's what God has called you to. So this guy is from him. He's, He's a wise person. He knows. You know what? The Lord's coming back again. Lord, it's the last thing I want to do, but Father, I want to please you. It's the last thing I want to do. Have you ever said that? Father, this is the last thing I want to do, but for your glory, good night, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go out and I'm going to do it. So, beloved, he's a wise servant. Why is that? Listen to me. 
He keeps his eyes on the signs of the times. In other words, he sees all the prophetic and precursory signs unfolding around him as foretold by Scripture, and he knows now that the nearness of the Lord's return is there. So he wants to keep himself morally and spiritually prepared because he knows his Lord can come at any moment when he least expects it. Boy, Jesus said there was going to be great earthquakes and famines and pestilences and apostasy. And boy, I see it like never before. He must be at the very doors. He must be. Lord, are you coming today? See, beloved, that's how we're to be ready. Um, in anything in life, you have to prepare yourself. You know, you, you just don't go and say, I'm going to be a computer expert. Okay, throw the computer down in front of me. Well, duh. No, you've got to be trained. Amen. You got to put the time in. You, how do you play a piano? <laughs> Terrible, right? Those 88s. I can play it like that. But you have to study. You have to learn how to play a piano. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of readiness. It takes a lot of dedication. And beloved, it takes a lot of foresight. What is it? What is my goal? What direction am I going in? What is it I want to do? What is it I'm trying to achieve here? Right? See, that's a righteous servant. In Portuguese, that's a juiz nis cabeça. No, I'm yeah. He's got some brains in his head. <laughs> okay? He's thinking. He's wise. He's faithful is what he's talking about here, beloved. So as a, wise, as a faithful and wise household servant whom his Lord has made, notice he says to be ruler. Kathistami is that word. That means he's appointed and set him in charge over his household. The righteous servant daily dedicates and devotes himself to his Lord. He tries to be faithful and fruitful to his Lord. He consecrates himself. He commits himself unto his Lord. See, he's faithful. He's wise. He's got his eyes. What's going on? Not just what's before him. I always say, Father, help me. Give me prophetic foresight that I can look down the corridors of time and foresee things to come as you reveal them to me. Right? That's what you need. So you can look down the corridors of time. This is what's going to happen. You parents know what I'm talking about. You say to your children all the time, you keep doing that, you are getting an accident, and, and, or this is going to happen. Uh, I'll never forget when my son Jacoby was a young kid. That, that was a couple years ago, right, Cobe? See the plugs over there? He was one day playing with a butter knife. <whistles> twisting around like that, and I looked. <gasps> no, Kobe. I called him Roy. No, Roy. And he'd walk over, I said, oh, dude, he's going to light up his life right now. No, Kobe, Kobe, listen to me. What did Daddy say about that? And I always say to him, what did Daddy say? I made them repeat because I want to make sure he gets it in his head. When they go like this, I don't know. They know. Make them give an answer for the hope that's in them with meekness and fear, okay? What did Daddy say, Kobe? You go upstairs and think about it. Daddy will be up in a half an hour. I want to hear what, what you're going to do. But I said to Ellie, don't they have these little guys that you can plug in the sockets so nobody gets zapped? <laughs> she says, oh, yeah, I can buy them. Get them. <laughs> I can just see them there. <laughs> right? but, but you know, beloved, you, see, you already foreknow what's going to happen. Amen? As a parent. And listen to me, kids. Your mom and dad forgot more than you've learned so far. You have a lot of access to technology. You have none of the experience behind it and don't even know how to achieve it. I hated inorganic chemistry. I had to study that when I was in school. I loved organic chemistry. I hated inorganic. And you know what the professor always say? Let me see your worksheet. What? <laughs> you want to see my what? Well, well, you took it. <laughs> well, Nick, let me see Joel's worksheet. <laughs> you know what there was on Joel's worksheet? It was his name. <laughs> no, you had to show how you achieved, how you reached that. Algebra, calculus, all of that. You had to show how did you get there? It wasn't like you kids today. Oh, let me see. That's it right there. There's the answer. You don't even know how you got there, right? And that's a sad fact, beloved. And kids don't know how to research today except on the Internet. They don't know how to go to a library. They don't know how to weed through mountains of, of uh, information and books. And I'm not trying to degrade your kids. I'm just telling you that's a reality. That's what's happening uh, today. But you see, beloved, he says that, He's wise because he knows he's going to persevere in the faith because in due season, his Lord's coming back. So he wants to make sure he's responsible. He wants to make sure, beloved, that he's dependable. He wants to make sure he's a righteous servant. So that's the first point. He's responsible. Secondly, he's revered. Look what he says in verse 46. Blessed is that man whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. What a promise to the righteous servant 
Notice, who's found hard at work in his Lord's household when he comes back. Jesus said that he is makarios. He's blessed. When you read the Beatitudes, blessed, blessed, makarios, makarios. What does that mean, Pastor Joel? It means to be supremely happy, fortunate, to be envied by all. Why? Because when the Lord unexpectedly returns after his absence, he finds the righteous servant to have been faithful and loyal to him and to his household's beloved. He's redeemed the time waiting for his Lord's return. He's been occupied and busy waiting for his Lord's return. He's been daily looking and longing and waiting for his long return. So that means he's revered by the Lord. He's blessed by the Lord. He's honored by the Lord. He's approved by the Lord. Yes, you're my righteous servant. I've seen it in your life all along. I saw it when I come back. You see, beloved, he's a what? He is a revered. He's revered by God. Blessed, he's responsible, he's revered by God, beloved. And you know what? I want you to see his reward, and I'll close with this in verse 47. He says, Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Now the word ruler, kathistemi, means that Jesus will so reward this righteous servant who's been a faithful administrator of his household, that he'll now exalt him. He will promote him from being just a righteous servant to a leader and a ruler in his household in the new heavens and the earth. And notice he says, I'm not going to turn over just some of these things to him. I'm going to turn over what? All of these things to him. What's his reward? He's going to inherit eternal life. What's his reward? He's going to live eternally in the kingdom of God. What's his reward? He's going to rule and reign with Christ throughout the universe, beloved, over everything. You see, he's truly a God's household servant. He's a righteous servant. Amen? That's point number one. I'll have to give you points two and three next week. But next week, I'm going to talk about the reckless servant. And I'll just give you a foretaste right now before we get there. A little bit about a reckless servant. We need to understand that the reckless servant thinks he has plenty of time. Because there's when the cat's away, the mouse will play. You see, in his absence, I can go do whatever I want to do. That's what this guy's doing, right? We're going to see that as we go on next week. About the reckless servant. A lot of Christians are like that today. They're reckless. Well, Jesus hasn't come back yet. And they don't even see the precursory signs. My question to you is, are you a righteous servant? I hope you can say amen, praise the Lord. You're not righteous because of you. You're righteous because of his grace working in the spirit, working in you, with you, through you. Amen. So we praise God that God has made us. Philip, imagine he's entrusted us with all of the jewels of the kingdom. Beloved, a nobody like me, God made me a preacher. I can't believe it, honestly. I I just can't believe it. I I look back, I, I said, somebody said to me, why don't you run for president? I said, I have to take a step down if I did. I'd rather be a preacher than a president any day. Because if I get up there and told the truth, that'll lynch me already. <laughs> so, God's household servant. Next week, Lord willing, the crypt don't rise. We'll pick up on this. Let's go to the throne of grace.